Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 14th EOGO lecture series. This is brought to you by the Philippine Geographical Society in partnership with the University of the Philippines Department of Geography. And this is also part of the 40th anniversary celebration of the UP Department of Geography. My name is Joseph Alis, and I will be your moderator for this lecture. Um, just a few reminders before we proceed. Kindly keep your microphones on mute during the presentation. Uh, we encourage you to interact by typing your comments and questions in the chat box. They will be addressed during the open forum. Also, please note that this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available for viewing after the event through the Department of Geography YouTube channel. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce the president of the Philippine Geographical Society, uh, Professor Emmanuel Garcia, to give in, um, an opening remarks. Thank you, Sir Joe. Uh, magandang hapon po sa lahat. Welcome to another episode of the Heyo J. Lecture Series. This is a venue for highlighting works and research of our fellow geographers and geography adjacent scholars. This also serves as space for geography practitioners in the academe, industry, civil society, and wider community to share ideas and state-of-the-art undertakings to promote geography as an academic discipline, method, and discourse in its mission to serve multiple publics. The Heyo J. Lecture Series is a collaborative undertaking by the UP Department of Geography and the Philippine Geographical Society, also as part of the 40th anniversary celebration of the department. Um, for the 14th talk of the Heyo J. Lecture Series for 2023, our speaker examines the unique rela relationalities materializing in and between islands as both geographic and category and symbolic um, concept through narratives of the origin of the Santo Nino, the Tacloban image, particularly those concerning the exchange of Santo Nino images between Base and Tacloban, and those attributing the image beginnings to a place of wood adrift at sea. Quite interesting as and as is the word cloud that we have generated from your registration keywords, which highlights the words deep, vast, life, meaningful, dynamic, complex, alive, majestic, and dangerous. As always, it is interesting to see um, how these words connect to, uh, to this afternoon's lecture. So muli po, maraming salamat. Thank you for joining us. And on behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Geography, welcome to the 14th Heyo JL Lecture Series. Thank you very much, uh, Eman. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Eman, for the opening remarks. Um, allow me to introduce our invited guest speaker for this lecture. Uh, Mars Edvinson Briones is a doctoral researcher at the Multidisciplinary Environmental Studies in the Humanities, or MESH, uh, which is a re research hub uh, of the University of Cologne in Germany. His current research draws upon the environmental humanities, disaster, anthropology, and island studies to examine how creative and discursive expressions of place and its hazards articulate broader ideas about nature, society, entanglements, and how these can contribute to decolonizing disaster studies. In 2013, he earned his bachelor's degree in communication arts from the University of the Philippines uh, Tacloban College, where he then served as a faculty member of the Division of Humanities until 2022. In 2020, he obtained his master's degree in art history from UP Diliman, where he wrote his thesis on the geopoetics of the Santo Nino de Tacloban image and devotion. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker, Mars Edwin San Brianos. Salamat. Uh, salamat, Dr. Palis. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this uh, lecture. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Full screen. Okay. Um, let me just move this. 
Okay, anyway. <laughs> Medyo nabablock yung, yung slide ng like... Okay, it's gone. Yun, so... um. Uh, hello, good day to all, and good afternoon to um, our attendees in in the Philippines. Uh, like I said, uh, una sa lahat, um, dabo nga salamat. Many thanks to Dr. Uh, Joseph Pallis and the UP Department of Geography, uh, as well as the Philippine Geographical Society, for um, uh, this great opportunity uh, to present my paper, Between Islands Through Storied Sea. Uh, so, just a bit of a... Wait a second. I can't seem to. Wait, uh, I'll unshare long. I can't seem to proceed to the next slides. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it seems like it's moving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so just a bit of a personal anecdote. Um, I have long been interested in islands and seas. And that's maybe because I grew up in a coastal city uh, in an island. Uh, in, in the last two years, these are some of the images and texts that uh, I have collected. Some are maps and artworks uh, I took photos of, while others are stuff I myself created just out of sheer enjoyment. And uh, I guess this interest uh, and the actual experience of having lived in an island have uh, somehow played into how I wrote the paper that I'm going to be presenting now. Uh, much of this paper is taken from my master's thesis, for which my advisor was uh, Dr. Patrick Flores, and which I finished in 2020 in UP Diliman. The paper draws particularly upon the last uh, part of chapter two and the first part of chapter three, where I touch upon the nisology of Leite and Samar, to contextualize the idea of what I devotion to the Santo Nino and to evoke and sort of map the setting in which uh, the Kaagi or history of the Santo Nino de Tacloban takes place. My talk today um, is also connected to the paper I presented at the 2021 International Conference on Geographical Studies, also organized by the UP Department of Geography and the Philippine Geographical Society where I discussed how the Santo Nino de Tacloban image and devotion were entangled in placemaking discourses and practices that sought to define uh, an quote-unquote East Visayan identity and region in what was purported to be the quote-unquote decade of development in Leyte and Samar in the 1970s during the Marcos administration. Uh, in that talk, uh, I ended with a photo of a sculpture of the Santo Nino de Tacloban standing on the island of Leyte in front of the Santo Nino Shrine and Heritage Museum in Tacloban City. My lecture today formally begins with this same image. Um, this image of the Santo Nino on top of Leyte Island serves to represent the rescaling of the devotion to El Capitan, which is the name of the Santo Nino in Tacloban, whose appellation was extended from Santo Nino de Tacloban to Santo Nino de Leyte, or Heavenly Patron of Leyte, as declared by the 1967 decree authorized by then Bishop of Palo Teotimo Pasis. To me, uh, this image of the Santo Nino fixed firmly on Leyte Island is an image of insularity that evokes more the sense of um, boundedness associated with a continent than the openness uh, of an island. There is so far, or as far as I have searched, no record that definitively pinpoints the origin of the Santo Nino de Tacloban image. This sculpture of the Holy Child in Tacloban believed to be at least two centuries old. Um, Although from the ecclesiastical perspective, uh, the image could be traced in Spanish colonial history to the arrival of the Augustinians in Leyte in 1768 um, and their subsequent founding of the Tacloban Parish two years after. However, there are also those stories that trace the origin of the image to another island, while other stories trace the image to the sea. 
these accounts uh, are also connected. Uh, I mean, they're also contested in the sense that they are regarded as lacking clear historical basis and complicated in the sense that certain aspects of these supposedly separate stories sometimes overlap or are interwoven um, as they are told and retold by different people. This image of the icon on the island, therefore, does not capture the, the plurality and fluidity of such narratives that people tell about the origin of the Santo Nino's culture. The structure of the rest of my talk is this. I will first flesh out the links among the themes of movement and water attributed to the Santo Nino and the concepts of Kaagi, which is Visayan for history, and Tidalectics to lay out a matrix with which to render and read the narratives. I will then present accounts about uh, Baliuan or exchange of Santo Nino images between two places facing each other in southwestern Samar Island, Basai, and uh, in northeastern Leyte Island, Tacloban, which is the capital of the Eastern Visayas administrative region. Leyte and Samar are the two largest islands comprising this region, along with uh, the smaller islands of Limasawa, Biliran, Tubabao, Humanhon, to name a few. I will then touch upon the Agipo story, which traces the sculpture's origin to a firebrand or a lump of wood found by a fisherman on sea or another body of water. Through this, uh, I try to challenge ideas that associate islandness with isolation to foreground island to island relationalities which is a form of connection in island studies that is not as widely examined as those of land and sea and island and continent or island and mainland. At the same time, I hint at how in relating the Santo Nino's origin and potency to the sea, the Agipo story marks marine space as an active storied sphere in the archipelagic assemblage and challenges Western imperialist notions that frame the sea as passive and empty space or aqua nullius. What this instantiates, I hope, is a move from a terra-centric or land-focused discourse to one that speaks to maritime histories and cultures, which uh, in our mostly watery planet, ironically called Earth, have not gained enough attention. Um, but I do not mean to abandon land, so to speak. Rather, I try to show how the stories of the Santo Nino may offer ways to think about the continuities between land and sea um, uh, and between islands. Drawing upon this, uh, towards the end of the talk, I, I then uh, outline possible trajectories towards an island studies in and of Eastern Visayas. Now, one of the most interesting things I learned in my research on the Santo Nino is that both movement and water are themes that permeate its stories. Much has been said about the Holy Child's affinity with and powers over water, being pleased when showered under the rain or bathed in the sea, resisting or controlling the sulog or ocean currents and traversing marine spaces. A novena from the 1800s describes how prayers for rain are answered by the Cebu Santo Nino if the image is brought to the sea where he could swim, and the practice described is even traced to older stories from the 1500s. These accounts evoke not only water's dynamic quality, but also how intrinsic water is to islandness in that the Santo Nino's aquatic connection is both pelagic and precipitative even ingested, if we are also to think of how the Santo Nino de Tacloban is believed to have healed the people of cholera in Tacloban in 1889. In many folk tales, the Santo Nino image itself is believed to be capable of traveling, a palaboy or hinlakawa, who wanders only to return with traces of his excursions. These themes of movement and water are also echoed in stories about the Santo Nino and Eastern Visayas, 
there are those accounts um, of certain Santo Nino images leaving footprints on the floor, having been lost and found floating at sea or protecting a town from tidal waves. So these stories investing the Santo Nino with motion allow for a nuanced understanding of its narratives as both iterant and itinerant, for history constitutes not only a temporal dimension, a mere retelling in chronological succession, but also, as Michel de Certeau would have it, a spatial practice, situating objects, ideas, events, and people. De Certeau acutely points out that narration in Greek is diegesis. It establishes an itinerary, it guides, and it passes through, it transgresses. In many Visayan languages, history is kaagi, which literally signifies passage, meaning the way something passed or the path it took. In Leitenia poet Illuminado Lucente's 1953 account, Kaagihan Santo Nino ha Takloban, one of the few earliest writings that sought to record El Capitan's origin and history, the image, as the title declares, is not Han, that is off or in Spanish, de Takloban, but ha or in Takloban. Indeed, as with many um, Catholic images, in the Philippines, there is not a single definitive account. Uh, in, in many cases, there is not a single definitive account of the Santo Nino images' provenance. But the difference in preposition in the title of Lucente's account would seem to unsettle the sense of the image's rootedness or belongingness to any single exclusive place. In any case, Lucente's title is conducive to a study of the entangled stories about the image's origin, which is told in ways that do not trace the Santo Nino image directly and unequivocally to Tacloban and that have narrative elements that sometimes merge. Because of the plural and overlapping studies of the Santo Nino image's origin, its kaagi may be said to be nonlinear, fluid, and intertextual. A way to think of kaagi in this sense is through the aquatic imagination of Barbadian poet and historian Kamau Brathwaite, whose idea of tidalectics speaks to the movement of the water backwards and forwards as a kind of cyclic motion rather than linear. Literary, literary scholar Elizabeth Locri, who has ruminated on Brathwaite's concept in much of her work, fleshes out the potentials of tidalectics. De Locri writes, challenging the binarism of Western thought, the ocean and land are seen in continuous relation as shifting points of contact, arrival, departure, and transformation. Tidalectics engage what Brathwaite calls alternative or alternative historiography to linear models of colonial progress. This tidal dialectic resists the synthesizing telos of Hegel's dialectic by drawing from a cyclical model invoking the continual movement and rhythm of the ocean. The stories of the Baliuan and the Agipo are often differentiated from historical accounts and they are therefore deemed ideological. That is to say, they are understood as myths explaining how certain aspects of the physical and social world are the way they are. In this way, these stories offer such alternative or alternative versions of the Santo Nino's provenance that are tropological and thus more able to explore the relationality that characterizes archipelagic thinking. And so my intention here is not to interrogate the historicity of the stories to establish a singular slick strand of narrative tracing uh, the, the origin of El Capitan, but to follow their fluctuations, maintaining an openness to the possibilities of their imaginative kaagi. So now the story of the exchange of Santo Nino images. Every year, usually 10 days before the June 30 feast of the Santo Nino de Tacloban, the Balion Rites is held to 
as it were, reenact the so-called Baliuan or exchange of Santo Nino images between Tacloban in Leyte Island and Basay in Samar Island. The story behind this annual activity is a widely known account on, on the origin of the Santo Nino de Tacloban image. The exact date of this inter-island or transmarine exchange of images is undocumented, and this story has persisted largely through oral tradition. However, uh, this narrative was put into writing by Illuminado Lucente in his 1953 account, Kaagihan Santo Nino Tacloban, which is the document I mentioned earlier, and which also records um, the 1888 to 1889 series of events concerning the images loss and uh, eventual return to Tacloban, which uh, is believed to have miraculously ended a cholera epidemic in the city at the time. So in this document, Lucente begins by explaining that there had already been other documents in the past that recorded the history of the Santo Nino, but most of these had been lost to the storms, fires, and conflicts that had happened in the place. And so, prefaced with a history of lost documents, Lucente's 1953 account becomes a record of mediated retellings whose details have not entirely ebbed away but persist in his own memory. Lucente then proceeds to narrate the beginnings of Tacloban as a barrio named Kankabatok, which was under the town of Basay Samar. He claims that there was in the barrio an image of the Santo Nino um, that was no more than Duhakadangao or two hands high. The image was worshipped um, in uh, in the barrio, especially during the feast, and it was worshipped and celebrated, especially during the feast. Um, and in Basay as well, um, specifically in Buscada, a barrio just around one kilometer from the town proper, there was another image of the Santo Nino that was quote unquote small and poorly made. However, as promised by a Tagalog. Um, whose business had prospered in Buscada, the Santo Nino image was replaced with a bigger and beautiful one. After a few years, the cura paroco or parish priest of Basay saw the new Santo Nino image in Buscada and planned that this be exchanged with the Santo Nino image in Cancabatoc, since this barrio had already become larger and more populated than Buscada. After stating that the parish priest of Basay had planned the exchange of Buscada's image with that of Cancabatoc, um, Lucente continues, An ladawan han Santo Nino, ha Buscada, na dara ha Cancabatoc, ngan amo na nga hao itun ladawan niya ginsisingba, ginhahalaran, ngan ginsa sa urog han mga tulin ni Cancabatoc. So my, my translation in English is... Uh, you can see that there too. But after this statement, Lucente makes no more mention of the Cancabatoc Santo Nino image, what happened to it, or whether it was indeed given to Buscada in exchange of their Santo Nino image. However, this ambiguity is dispelled in another account of the Baluan. In her 1965 book, um, the Santo Nino of Cebu, which also includes narratives about Santo Nino images in other parts of the Philippines, Rosa Tenazas explains that the parish priest of Basay arranged with the inhabitants of both places for an exchange of images. Thus, in this account, the Cancabatoc Santo Nino image is more clearly said to have been transferred to Basay and the exchange to have been consensual. The question of whether what happened was an actual exchange of Santo Nino images between two places or a mere transfer of uh, one image of the so-called bigger and beautiful image from one place to the other is interesting, especially when made to bear on claims that no Santo Nino image from Cancabatoc after all had been given to Buscada in the purported exchange of images. My interlocutors in Basay during my field work could not tell whether the supposed 
um, where where the supposed uh, smaller Santo Nino image from Cancabatok was, nor if it is currently in Basay. If indeed the exchange was not consensual, it may have violated the will of devotees in Basay who were likely reluctant to let go of their Santo Nino image. And this speculation was actually once made by historian Dr. Rolando Borinaga in his 2003 newspaper article, The Underside of the Santo Nino's Odyssey. The accounts of the Baluan and the questions that attend them suggest that the relationalities between islands may be construed not only in terms of filiation and interdependence, but also power asymmetries. The annual Baluan rites is often framed by discourses highlighting the links between Tacloban and Basay, describing the event as symbolic of Tacloban's humble origins or Gingikanan in Basay, and of values such as helping, sharing, and exchanging of resources between the two places, as often invoked by religious and political leaders in their speeches during the event, during the Baluan rites. But such discourses of interdependence are dampened by doubts about the exchange of Santo Nino images. In this case, iconographies that isolate the Santo Nino de Tacloban that is, render the image as rooted in one island, as I described earlier, um, achieve what Akhil Gupta and James Ferguson said about the effect of cartographically imagining nations and cultures as autonomous and delineated, enabling the power of topography successfully to conceal the topography of power. The other story that traces the origin of the Santo Nino image broadly consists of the following events. A fisherman finds a piece of wood, an agipo, floating on sea, and after he brings it home, the wood eventually transforms into an image of the Santo Nino. Although this story is echoed largely in Cebu, when people recount the origin of their Santo Nino image, it also persists in Tacloban and Basay. Um, the Agipo story is often read as, uh, especially in the case of Cebu, it is often read as a counter-colonial narrative that seeks to erase the Santo Nino's traces of foreign cultural origin or becomes associated with discourses of identity and nation building, particularly in the emergence of Pantayong Pananao. In Basay, um, the narration of the Agipo story by Euphronio Taboclao does not necessarily echo this anti-colonial reading, but what is noteworthy here in his rendering of the story is how it overlaps with the detail in Lucenta's account concerning how El Capitan, the Santo Nino image, was donated by a Tagalog who had prospered in Basay. Taboclao's retelling, however, features the Agipo story to elaborate on how the Tagalog obtained the image. According to him, the Tagalog was a fisherman who asked the typical story, uh, the typical Agipo story goes, a fisherman who finds a piece of wood floating on a body of water, takes it um, home where it would later develop into an image of the Santo Nino. This story where the Santo Nino image is believed to be the product not of human virtuosity, but of sacred genesis, echoes many other folk tales in the Philippines that explain the origins of religious images in terms of their being self-generated or created by the divine beings into whom they would transform. The wood is also invested with material agency. It was active and spirited, drifting not aimlessly but intentionally toward the fisherman's boat, now and then sticking to the outrigger despite the strong sulog or current from the river that should have driven out, driven it out to the sea. Now, such aquatic themes of the Santo Nino image are well reiterated in many parts of Eastern Visayas. Often the narratives tracing El Capitan's origin to Basay emphasize the role of the sea in the logics of transfer through which the image was taken and at last placed in Tacloban somewhat evoking the 1888 to 1889 series of events 
when the image was lost and later returned to Tacloban. One account, for example, explains that El Capitan originally came from Basay, but that one time the ship carrying it sank. When the image was later found by a fisherman, it was brought to Tacloban. And even though it was not returned to Basay, this was anyway a known fact. Uh, in yet another account, El Capitan was washed ashore from Basay to the coast of Tacloban after a violent storm. Um, the stories of the Santo Nino, the Tacloban's origin I presented here, exemplify how islandness may be figured in terms of relation, as intimated by the Baluan stories, and emphasize water as an active and integral element of this archipelagic connection, as evoked by the stories describing the Santo Nino as originating in Agipo and floating on sea. The, the tidalectics in these narratives pertain to those intuitions that resist historiographical linearity and release the island from metaphors of isolation and self-sufficiency in order to lay bare inter-island relationality or intra-action as Barad would have it. And it's to also lay bare its underlying topographies of power. And these are just some of the particularities that I believe must figure in conceiving an island studies in and of Eastern Visayas, one that could take part in the broader discourses on islands, archipelagos, and seas in the Philippines and in other parts of the world. Um, while this interlocution requires um, or, or entails articulating the resonances among diverse places, it also necessitates attention to polyphony, um, to asymmetries and differences, especially those that are formed by their sense of being connected and those within a presumed or designated locality or supposedly unified region. Um, in making contributions to island studies, Eastern Visayas may present an interesting case. The region is characterized by a unique geography and political and social history whose interrelation has produced experiences, problems, and opportunities that are arguably more salient in this part of the country than in others. For one, it is um, a key site of the arrival, departure, and return of historical that is colonial and catastrophic forces. From Magellan to MacArthur, the islands and seas of Eastern Visayas served as the stage of pivotal events like um, the first mass in Limasawa, the Balangiga encounter, and the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Um, also marked by multiple interactional hazards like earthquakes, landslides, flash floods, and storm surges, the region has experienced several disasters from centuries back to contemporary times, um, including the 2013 super typhoon Yolanda, whose 10th, yeah, 10th anniversary we are commemorating in two weeks. One way I have pondered on disasters in the region through what may be said as archipelagic thinking concerns questions about the ways we isolate certain things the human from the non-human, natural hazard and human vulnerability, and our very towns and provinces as though natural hazards can recognize geopolitical boundaries. Moreover, it is said that for the region's diverse geography, it may be seen as, quote unquote, a microcosm of the Philippine archipelago, of the whole Philippine archipelago. And this may make sense, not only on the level of geographic description, but also in the political and sociocultural dimensions. For instance, um, as I have already hinted at, the idea of figuring Leyte and Samar as twin islands consists of various forms of relation, some emph emphasizing coherence while others signaling difference. Um, also worth probing is how scale inflects the meanings attached to islandness. One may examine, for example, the iteration of what in the larger global scale 
the local recalls a, cart a cartographic hierarchy of space in the more specific regional, in this case, Eastern Visayas scale, as in the ways Leyte and Samar Islands may perform a rather, so to speak, continental role and rule over smaller islands like Limasawa, Biliran, Kapul, uh, etc. In the same vein, um, the consolidation of the islands into one administrative region may be considered vis-a-vis -vis categories like city and province and urban rural continuities and discontinuities. Far from comprehensive, these themes simply outline possible trajectories in the theory of island and archipelagic thinking that draw upon Eastern Visayas um, from being an image and space of isolation, islands are being rethought for their capacities to illustrate and perform what Chandler and Puck call relational entanglements, which prove crucial in a world whose crises largely stem from the unawareness of or unwillingness to sense the interconnectedness of things, thoughts, lives, and afterlives. Perhaps a way to better grasp and follow these entanglements is a mode of island discourse that entails both interlocution and introspection that not only tells but traces the stories. Tidalectic, Kaagi may yield a richer understanding of certain configurations of time and space in islands and archipelagos. As both history and historiography, it may offer up a vocabulary and imagery with which to study, to sense, and to make sense of islands. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Herr Brionis. <laughs> Uh, at this point, we will proceed with the open forum. Uh, you may use the Zoom chat box to type your questions or comments, or you may raise your hand in a way to be acknowledged before you can directly ask your questions to the speaker. So if there are any questions or it doesn't have to be questions, they can be comments, they can be parallel stories, or they can be uh, a different scenario from other um, island setting here in the Philippines or even outside of the country. Questions? There is a, Mars, I don't know if you could see it, but I could just read this for you so you don't have to strain your eyes reading through this question. But we had a question, we have a question here from one of our colleagues. Uh, you mentioned many stories about the origin of the image. Did the stories change through time? Also, what specific aspect in their narratives did you consider reflecting the shared tradition between Basai and Tacloban and differentiating fact from folktale? Finally, what role did the image of Santo Nino play during the Yolanda event? There's a lot of questions to unpack. Maybe you can just choose which one you wanted to answer. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, Vanessa, for this uh, very rich um, set of questions. Uh, so on the first one, um, how the stories change through time. Um, yeah, the, in this case, historiography is important. Um, the, the way I wrote about the stories, I, I employed the idea of the design concept of Kaagi to um, allude not only to the telling of histories, but also to trace them and to trace the intersections among different narratives from different epistemological um, standpoints. And uh, if I'm gonna think about how the stories evolve, perhaps um, it, it, it depends on the framing as well. Um, they, the, the stories evolve um, based on certain interests in contemporary times and certain framings in contemporary times. So for example, the Baluan narrative, it was already there 
Um, I can't trace uh, the, the exact time when the narrative emerged. And even the, the, the event, it, it's still being questioned whether it's historical or not. Um, but like I said, that's not the purpose of my talk. But uh, the Baliwa narrative, for example, because um, one misconception about it is that Imelda invented the Baliwa narrative. But the thing is, Imelda, Imelda Marcos, um, as many people say, she sort of she was instrumental in turning the narrative into an annual devotional practice into the Balu and rites. So from the Balu and narrative to the Balu and rites, but the narrative has already been there even before Imelda was born, probably, or even before she became first lady. So the narrative precedes her, um, but probably before this um, time when the narrative was turned into an annual celebration. Uh, I'm not sure what framings there were at the time. Perhaps it was just simply a story of images being exchanged uh, between islands. But in more contemporary times, the Balua narrative is framed in this sense of, you know, um, in the more ideological sense of interdependence between two places, between two islands, between two towns between Basai and Tacloban. So there's that ideological framing um, of interdependence. And there's also the framing of indebtedness of Tacloban to Basai as um, its mother town, so to speak. So in that way, the stories evolve. They do acquire certain or, or more meanings. Um, but uh, they also not not necessarily evolve, but vary in contemporary times based on different people telling the story. So uh, some people, in a way, they combine supposedly different stories and uh, that's how they explain the origin of the Santo Nino image. Um, the second question on what aspects uh, in the narratives I consider reflecting the shared tradition between Basai and Tacloban. Yeah, uh, perhaps that I, I kind of touched upon it already. Um, the shared history in the sense of Tacloban being um, or originating from Basai. Um, but on differentiating fact from folktale, what I learned during my field work was um, there's been some desire from uh, certain church authorities to sort of establish the historical narrative of the Santo Nino. Because the position would be that W a narrative, it's not clear if it's it had it is you know historical, but what is for sure historical is the other narrative about the Santo Nino, which is the 1888 to 1889 series of events when it was sent to Manila for refurbishment, and then when it was sent back to Tacloban, the ship carrying it burned, it was lost, and then it was later recovered and returned to Tacloban on June 30, which is the reason why the feast was moved from January to June 30. And because supposedly it healed people of cholera in Tacloban at the time it arrived. Uh, at the dock. So there's that separation of which narratives about the Santo Nino are legitimate, so to speak, and which ones are more uh, bordering more on the, the folktale side. So there are these efforts, so much so that in the previous Baluan rites, when you know the MC narrates the Baluan narrative, there was ne not necessarily a conscious attempt to separate the story of the Baluan and the 1889 miraculous return. But in the subsequent year, in 2017, I noticed that the MC was sort of hedging the narrative already and saying that this is just a, a, a practice, to rec a devotional practice to recognize the links between Basay and Tacloban, but this is not historical. What is historical is the 1889 narrative of return. So there's some sort of... Um, it's there's there there are ways by which beliefs about the Santo Nino are becoming normative, and certain agencies that sort of mark the distinctions. Although, if you ask the people, the devotees, they do not necessarily distinguish between which one is a folktale, which one is a historical account. Um, on the question about uh, the Yolanda event, um, yeah, uh, for sure, many many um religious figures or the Santo Nino, for example, as a as a um an image, a devotional image in that is popular in data and summer. Um 
I, I haven't explored that aspect of, of like post Yolanda, but I could say that um, religion was instrumental in a way of sort of at least momentarily um, allowing people to recover, so to speak, for, from a more psychological um, way. And there's this image actually of devotees. It became popular. I think it, it uh, won a contest. This image of um, a group of people, mostly women, somewhere in Tolosa, I guess, in Tolosa or in Tanawan, I'm not sure anymore. But in the photo, you could see them holding a procession after the typhoon. And in the background, you could still see the image of like the the, the devastated um, geography with coconut trees fallen or like without leaves and all that. So, yeah, uh, I guess that's uh, how far I can answer for now. Thank you. There's another question here, uh, kind of similar to something that you've written. And if I may just insert real quick while Mars recovers a little bit. <laughs> um, Mars's article um, is going to come out from the, uh, for the Philippine Geographical Journal, vo Volume 66, and it's going to be launched uh, later before the year, before this, the month ends. So it will be explored there. Um, I was just reminded because of the second question that was asked by Flory for you uh, were, um, well, I don't want to go ahead. I would rather hear what you have to say about this. But uh, Flory said, Resil Mojares, national artist Resil Mojares quoted, uh, and I quote, Christian images in the Philippines were inserted, unquote, into a culture with a tradition of sacred iconography. And, and, and uh, she provided some, Bibliographic entries to back it up. Do you have any comments or uh, anything you want to respond uh, to it? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, uh, Mojares has uh, written extensively about the Santo Nino as well, and uh, um, yeah, it, like when we talk about um, Christian belief and uh, cr Christian images, Catholic images being introduced to the Philippines. It's important to think of hybridity in the sense that um, at the time, Filipinos were not merely accepting something foreign. That's why there's all this discourse also, like I, I think I quoted Sally Ness earlier, where she spoke about how the um, uh, Agipo narrative could be read as an anti-colonial um, uh, narrative in the sense that it denies the origin of the Santo Nino from the Spaniards who came here and brought it, but rather traces it to something pre-Hispanic. It was found as a lump of wood floating on a body of water. Uh, so it's important to think of hybridity so that we do not reduce um, people at the time as merely accepting something foreign passively, but rather um, melding different beliefs, different practices, and different iconographies as well. Local um, artisans who were making images of um, the Santo Nino or other Christian images. Um, there was There's a specific iconography by which art historians distinguish, uh, you know, um, religious cultures that are um, folk, that's how they would call it, that has folk elements. So, yeah. There was a bit of erasure too, right? Um, of the Santo Nino, which also plays <laughs> a huge part in, in uh, <clears throat> its veneration by the people. So it's not just something really um, uh, something that most people think is just because there's Santo Nino doesn't mean that it's accepted, you know, beyond uh, the the people who have faith in it. So that's the interesting tension that I think. Uh, well, I think it's in your article. Sorry about that. You didn't mention it, but I thought that was that was pretty much in the spirit of what Flory also wanted to ask about uh, um, the cult, the sacred iconography. The other question, um, I'm really sorry. It's it's uh it's it's I have a hard time quite uh understanding it, but but I'll try to read as much as I can. But still, uh, the in the Philippines or Philippines people have a lack of understanding or in understanding the essence of Christianity, Lord and prayer in our daily practical and working life. Is it due to the lack of ministries activities and not taking new projects and initiatives by church and its concerned authority? I don't know what um, you can comment from that. Yeah. Or maybe we could ask guess, Arka uh, also to, to explain further. Mars, just go ahead. Yeah. 
Okay, so I guess this uh, comment is coming from a very clear um, subject position. Um, because uh, uh, it, it's also kind of like uh, contentious how we define the essence of Christianity because um, religion as, as art of culture is dynamic and uh, the way that people define faith or the way they practice faith could vary. And um, there might also be people who um, are critical about, you know, defining or like policing faith in a certain way. But I do, of course, uh, from, from the standpoint of someone who is uh, concerned about liturgy and the ecclesiastical, um, uh, this would be a, a concern. Uh, and then I saw this too when I did my field work on the Santo Nino, that there are attempts where certain people uh, or let's say church authorities are concerned about how feasts are celebrated or like they are they fear the loss of the quote unquote essence of the feast when there are all these other adjunct activities that are you know connected to to the celebration of the event thank you are there any other questions thank you very much for those questions are there any other comments if they're not questions Maybe another thing that um, <clears throat> while people are still thinking up of something, uh, um, uh, you mentioned about dialectics, uh, tidal dialectics uh, first uh, brought to life by Kamau Brathwaite from from the Caribbean, and later on much much more eloquently, if if you if you will allow me to say that, by Elizabeth Delory when she wrote the book Routes and Roots, and then uh, recentered the idea of. Dialectics or tidal dialectics in the framing of how uh, islands are seen. Uh, it's I like what you said, Mars, earlier. I, I like the way you kind of look at the movement in the sea because the way to look at the islands is not really just outcrops of, of, of lithosphere floating in an, a vast ocean, but it's really more about connections. It's about the rhythm of the tides, of the ocean currents. And a lot has been written about it from the perspective of mostly post-colonial societies that look into how they feel it has been misunderstood by mostly colonial uh, writers, uh, that, that everything had to be captured scientifically or factually, when in fact there's a lot more involved. Um, in, my, in my own class alone, and I have students here uh, in, in the island studies, uh, we even look at how it, it offers itself a feminist perspective that understands the ocean as an amniotic sac you know, as a, as a kind of um, uh, nurturing thing, but also a vi uh, equally there is a violence to the waters. So it's not necessarily nurturing and you're all well and, and all that, but it could also be a site of so much violence. And that's why that kind of tension that shows either this or that um, um, is what makes the dialectics and the rhythm really of the tides a very, in my opinion, of course, um, uh, important and and resonant um, lenses to look at how island studies uh, should be uh, looked at and analyzed. So anyway, um, are there any uh, other questions or comments or maybe we can entertain one more if we got one. Oh, uh, oh, oh, Ivan. Ivan has a question. Ivan, please go ahead. Ivan, can you unmute? Oh, um, F, can we do something with Ivan? He can't unmute. Ayan, um, and I think okay, I can go. Very nice. Okay, Bob. Um, okay. this is less of a question than a like maybe um set of manifestations and, and a note of like appreciation also for your presentation, Sir Mars. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I I like to. La, um, to focus on your, you your deployment, your reference to this the Visayan concept of history, kakaagi, and then you mentioned that in relation, to, or you also mentioned the pantayong pananaw, and then um like the pantayo, I I am a Philippine studies student, and then we 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 are exposed to the the 
the teachings, the principles of Pantayam Pananaw, and the, the set of ideas that um, comes with it. Um, like the Pantayam Pananaw can, can, has a tendency to be, it can be read as Tagalog, Tagalog centric. So it's important uh, to, to have to be exposed to this, um, the uh, other deployments of, uh, the deployments of, of, of concepts uh from from other regions or other parts of the Philippines, like the 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 idea of the of the kaagi and then you said you sh and then by deploying or by introducing to us this idea of the kaagi the word kaagi and then yung that its connotation of uh yung yung passage uh path so there there's this enrichment that is going on so it's not exactly like like kasaysayan tagalog kasaysayan versus the other conceptual conceptualizations of history but you know but in 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 keeping with the like the filipino concept parang the enrichment of filipino sensibilities and conceptualizations so parang we can make use of this um um other uh, terms or concepts to enrich yung you know, like for instance yung concept of history and then you the okay so kaagi is introduced it's in place and then you saw parang you showed how it's at work in this in this intertwined narratives that you shared uh to us na how parang yon kaagi at work in this multiple con at times conflicting narratives of people from different places um from from different islands and ayun parang that's that's one of my ano talaga parang major points of appreciation um, and takeaways from your talk. So, yun. Salamat po. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, salamat. Um, indeed. Uh, um, I guess I'm also, like, personally very drawn to, to words and sort of, like, unpacking um, the meanings, particularly uh, um, those from my mother tongue. And, uh, yeah, it was deliberate to use Kaagi even in my master's thesis. Um, uh, because I found it very useful. Yeah, totoo na ano nga, iba, iba yung kasaysayan. It has different connotations. And kaagi, uh, I feel like it captures both history and historiography in the sense that, well, it is history, but when you speak about agi and passage or path, there's that uh, act, act or performance of, of tracing. And uh, there's also other words related to it, like ginagian would mean pinagdaanan what one has gone through is also from the word agi and pamaagi means method so history and method uh, are captured by by kaagi thank you mars and thank you evan for that question uh, or comment um any other question okay Thank you. Well, anyway, uh, at this point, I'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Mars Edmondson uh, Briones, for that wonderful talk. Um, and um, sorry, I'm looking at my <laughs> my code. You but I couldn't find it. Um, thank you very much for your for this insightful discussion. Of course, allow me to present the certificate of appreciation to our to our speaker. And uh, okay, there you have it. Um, give me some time. The uh, this certificate of appreciation is given to Mars Edmondson Briones for the valuable insights and expertise shared as virtual resource speaker for the talk Between Islands Through Storied Sea as part of the Heo Geo lecture series of 2023 held on uh, 24 October 2023. Signed by yours truly, Joseph Palis, and the president of the Philippine Geographical Society, Emmanuel B. Garcia. Um, also, just to give you a sense of what's to come um, of the Hiyoji lecture, we have a Professor Jelly Gallam from the History Department of UP Diliman, who's going to give a talk based on his dissertation uh, entitled Crim Chinese Criminals and the Frontier in Spanish Philippines. That's happening on November 10. It's a Friday at 5.30 p.m. And also, Edward Nadurata, he's a Filipino-American based in UC Irvine, um, is going to give a talk 
based on his uh, dissertation data gathering in the Philippines about uh, older adults, older persons, migration to the diaspora in the Philippine setting. It's going to happen December 6, um, I believe it's a Wednesday, uh, 2023 at 5 p.m. <laughs> also, we're happy to announce our International Conference on Geographical Studies 2023 with the theme Performative Geographies, uh, Specialities of Embodiment, Performance, Ideology, and Practice happening on November 24 to 25, 2023. This is a virtual event. The deadline for the abstract submission is on December, November 6, 2023. So please send us your abstracts and provocations and, and it doesn't have to necessarily intersect performative geographies, but then what uh, what is not performative uh, in what we're doing anyway? So please do consider submitting um, submitting your abstract. Lastly, our past lectures are all stored in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. You can visit our channel to watch our previous lectures as well as other recorded events of the Philippine Geographical Society and the Department of Geography.